Um, all right, so why don't I just start with intros for you guys? Because, Matt, I saw your deck, and I want to give you guys as much time. Um, so we don't do it like we do with the racers, where half the time speaking, half the time is pitch review. This is this is mostly just conversational. So you'll have as much time as you want to speak, and we'll just spice in Q and A as we go through. Um, but I get to intro you. Are you ready? I'm so excited. Sounds so sincere. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to start with the personal stuff. So for everybody, these these are two of my good friends that you're going to be talking to with and colleagues. So this is Matt Gardner and Mitchell Coco. And Matt, I got to know right when I started working at Idea Center. So even before I was trying to figure out if I wanted to work here, I called up Matt while he was still- Oh my gosh, I forgot that. <laughs> University of Utah. And we, we hit it off. And then when I started working at the Idea Center, they showed me to my office and it was just in Matt's office. <laughs> and so we got to share offices for a long time and car trips, Vegas trips, lots of stuff like that. I got to know Matt really well and it was a ton of fun through that. Matt's also a coach. Um, so you're aware. So the Balthazar team has Matt as the, the OSV coach there. So that means you all can just dogpile him with any questions, knowing that he's, he's a paid member of, he's a paid consultant for all of you now. And then Mitchell, I got to know when he came in as a Notre Dame student. So there's a development officer that said, you got to meet Mitchell. He's kind of crazy. He's a poor fencer, but a really hungry entrepreneur. So Mitchell came in as an intern and he started working with all of our student interns. And now Mitchell has graduated and is now working with our fund. So both Matt and Mitchell work with the fund of the Idea Center. And we originally set this session to be towards the tail end of the programming, because we always thought that the end of July might have been a demo day. But now that it's pushed off, it's um, just, just keep that in mind. So we wanted you guys to be able to start understanding how to go for investment, what different types of money looked like, what people were motivated by, what to consider um, for more of the tail end thought. So it's coming probably a little earlier uh, than we necessarily, you guys still just keep focusing on traction, but this consider this mostly FYI. And then next month you'll start more seriously doing this type of planning. Um, but let me do the LinkedIn. That's all like off the top of my head. So, so Matt Gardner, now, the title is Director of New Ventures and Investments at Notre Dame. And before he was from 2013 to 2017, he oversaw the launch of nearly 120 startups through the University of Utah's uh, Tech TVC. Except, what does TVC stand for? Technology and Venture Commercialization Office. Okay. So basically, what Notre Dame was, they poached people from that office, which is top of the country for commercialization, and just dropped them into Notre Dame. So Matt was part of that exodus of the Utah team. Um, prior to Utah, he worked as a business strategist and director of media for Child Rescue, a nonprofit based out of Los Angeles, uh, California, but not featured on this bio. You were also a music video director <laughs> for one of the Killers music videos, which I should bring up in a little bit, where your this mom was head, live. This your is mom was head caterer. Is that right? Yes, I had my mom cater it. <laughs> we had okay. no money. So music video director turned someone trying to save people from sex trafficking turned <laughs> new venture turned uh, investor. All right. So that's Matt Gardner. And now Mitchell. Um, Mitchell, I love that you have more bullet points than Matt does on this bio. I don't. Where did you even get those bullet points from, by the way? I was curious about that. Claire, Claire Doherty does awesome job doing LinkedIn stalking. Oh, got it, got it. All right, so so Mitchell's the fund manager of the Pit Road Funds, that's the Notre Dame fund, and it focuses on early stage pre-seed and seed investment aimed at accelerating growth of high potential startups. We'll talk a little bit more about what those terms mean, but early companies. And before Notre Dame, he worked at Equid. This was an internship leading e-commerce solutions for small businesses worldwide, and uh and he did some other stuff oh wait a, okay this is fun recently mitchell was named the 2019 young entrepreneur of the year for your work at notre dame 
Who are you named that by? Uh, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> so by our VP, our VP calls Mitchell the Young Entrepreneur of the Year. All right. So Matt, you can um, take the screen. Oh, you can I? Yeah, you can take screen and I'll just give you mic. And uh, anybody who's got questions, um, if you got kids in the background and don't want to go unmute, then just put it in chat. I'll steward it. But uh, Matt, just you guys, Matt Mitchell, you guys take it away. All right, thanks, guys. Um, so uh, what we're going to do here is we have put together this. Uh, bear with us, kind of an ugly slide, but you'll get the point. Uh, and the hope is, is here is. Um, um, uh, is this is kind of what we want to talk about. Can everybody see this? Yeah, it's coming through. Okay. So uh, basically, you know, we, I did a podcast back in Utah for, it was a group of uh, artists and it, the podcast was called The Other F Word and it was around finance. Um, and the idea is uh, the, the idea of what we want to show you here is um, how kind of all the different options of how you can collect investment or finance within your, your startup company. So, so the hope is, is, you know, we, we, uh, Mitchell and I, uh, we oversee a $22 million venture capital fund. Uh, but again, um, venture capital is a different thing. And so typically what you do is when you think of startups, you think of venture capital, you say, okay, I'm going to create this startup and I'm going to go down and, and, and get venture capital money. Uh, hopefully what this slide does is makes you understand and rethink that idea that venture capital isn't for every company. And hopefully what this can do is this slide will go through and show you a variety of different options of, of ways in which to uh, get a startup and actually create a, a solid business out of it. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go through different models. The first one is, of course, is a bootstrapping model. Uh, basically with bootstrapping, we all know you work hard on your business and, uh, and you do not take outside capital. Instead, you use your own cash flow to run your businesses. The advantage of this is you, can, can, uh, you keep complete control of your companies. Disadvantages is you hinder a lot of growth. Uh, some of the Fortune 500 companies have never taken outside investment. Uh, then what they've done is they've sold a product that the margins are so good, meaning they sell it for a hundred, but it costs a, a dollar to make. The margins are so great that they can take those margins and just reinvest them in the company. And then they grow and grow and grow over time and they never take outside investment. So those are, so there's really great ways of, of, of why you want to go down this in, uh, bootstrapping path. Not only that, when typically when companies come to us, we try to force them to go bootstrap. Uh, the reason is, is because people think money is gonna solve their problems. And in reality, it's actually gonna make it way worse. And hopefully we'll, we'll show you why. Uh, the other one is debt. Everybody knows kind of this path is uh, you, you get a lender to lend you money. Advantages of this is you have a relationship with the ender, your lender and that relationship ends after you pay, repay the loan. The dis disadvantages is if you cannot make the payments, the lender can force you into bankruptcy, right? But again, there's a lot of reasons why this model might work for you guys, right? You might want to do this depending on your business. Uh, you've heard a lot of venture guys saying never take out debt to fi finance your startups, but there's other people that say, no, sometimes it actually might be best. Um, the next one are small business loans. Uh, an organization that helps small businesses get loans from private banks, the advantages of this, uh, good for small businesses that uh, have been turned down from traditional banks, has less than 500 employees. SBA loans tend to have lower interest rates and can be a very, very great thing. Uh, crowdfunding, which you guys have heard uh, probably, there's two types of crowdfunding. There's non-equity crowdfunding, which means uh, basically uh, you promote it to a, a large, uh, to a platform. A lot of people come in and there's $5 perks, $10 perks. But uh, at the end of the day, they're not owning any of your company. However, there's this other model of crowdfunding called equity crowdfunding, uh, which is people, a large, uh, uh, a large group of people are owning bite sizes of your, of your company. 
Uh, the advantages of this is uh, you raise money from current or future customers. The, the value of that, it's actually, not only are you raising capital, but it's also validating uh, your company. So th this is why crowdfunding got so, so uh, uh, successful or uh, uh, became very attractive. Disadvantages is you can create crowded cap tables, meaning you have a lot of people that have invested, which can create a nightmare. Um, everybody says advice is if you go down this pathway is uh, to develop a marketing campaign that drives your community to your, uh, to your campaign page. Uh, um, because these can, the, the, to, to make these successful, the front load of this is, is, a, is a lot. Um, I'm going to pause there. Does anybody have questions right now? Anybody? Okay. Next, our grants, uh, non-dilutive capital. Uh, we try really hard with a bunch of our very, very highly technical companies to go after grants. The reason is, is because uh, you want to go grants because, again, you don't have to pay them back and they, you're not giving away any equity out of your deals. The di disadvantage of these is they take a lot of time. Um, so they, they, you know, um, you have to write the grants, but then you're waiting for about three to six months in order for you to even see if you, you, you get these grants or not. But again, for specific early stage projects, grants are great, specifically these SBIR loans or grants. I mean, the next, uh, is friends and family. Uh, this is an actual thing, a term that people, yeah, go ahead. Matt, really quick. I just saw a chat thing. Uh, Karina is asking, where do we find grants? Uh, Karina, one of the things that there's different types, one of the resources that might be helpful to you guys, I just found out about yesterday, that you all have access through the, the library of Notre Dame called FDO or Funders Directory Online. Let me, let me get a little bit of detail. We did a short video with someone in Foundations, Foundation Directory Online. And uh, those places can give out grants as well. And those might be themed according to your area. Uh, so there's basically an online search engine. So Google is always a way to find these types of places, but apparently you'll have like privileged access through a library paid resource. Yeah, and typically you can actually go to your state as well. State typically has some form of this. So for example, uh, a great uh, one to go to is uh, uh, Indiana, for example, Indiana has Elevate Ventures. Um, they, they award, they have specific grants that they will uh, they give out to, to startups. Not only that, uh, once you go to these resources, they'll know where to go for other non-dilutive pathways. Um, the next is friends and family. This is a, a lot of how startups are, uh, get financed at the very early stages. These are investors and individuals uh, willing to write uh, smaller check sizes. So this is 10,000 uh, bucks, sometimes up to $150,000 of their own personal money. Um, the advantages are their friends, families, and what are called fools. Um, the disadvantages is they are friends, family, and fools. Uh, these can become nightmares. Uh, I've seen horrible experiences where um, someone got their uncle to invest in the deal uh, and it was blind leading the blind. They just thought, you know, a $10,000 check in, uh, all of a sudden you send it to wire that money to a bank account. It's a handshake deal. Uh, it's a nightmare. Um, so uh, there's a lot of baggage that comes with this. Uh, there is advice when you go to friends and family, try to find accredited investors. Accredited investors are people who own a million dollars in assets, not including their home or make over $200,000 in two years in a row. Um, and again, uh, there's a lot that goes in here. Uh, you can go ahead and research this, but if you do decide to go to friends, family, and, and fools, uh, beware of this. Uh, but again, it can be a very, very easy way to get initial investment in the door. Uh, and investors. So I don't know how much I want to dig into here, but there are... Uh, to, to, I'm going to break the investors kind of into two bucket angel investors and then and venture capitalists and these are people who uh, that lend their money and are likely uh, uh, charges a principal and interest on on your equity in your business um, and there are a lot of ways in which investors will invest in your companies right so one is is they'll they'll say okay I'll give you a dollar for 10% of your company 
right? But another way they'll do it is what are called convertible debt options. Um, so a normal loan with a, uh, it's, it's them giving a, a loan with an interest rate attached to it where the debt can be converted into equity in the future. So what this looks like is let's say um, I invest $10 into your company. Um, what we're doing is we're not actually pricing your company right now. Uh, what, what we're doing is we're holding off the pricing of your company for a later date. Um, and then what will happen is my money will convert uh, at equity at that future date, and I will have collected interest on my money at that date as well. Uh, Mitchell, any more clarification you want to give there? I'll, I'll talk about this, some of the terms behind this stuff. So JM, for instance, I'll, I'll talk about safe notes later in, in this presentation. Perfect. Another one, uh, factoring or what's called venture debt uh, sometimes. Uh, this is when a person or entity that buys your accounts receivable at a discounted rate. So let's say uh, you have a lot of uh, accounts receivable, meaning you have a lot of deals sitting out there that are uh, about to convert over, but you're hard on cash, you need money. You can actually go to investors and say, hey, I got a million dollars that's supposed to be coming in uh, uh, of uh, pure profit. Uh, I need $100,000 and for that, uh, you'll make $120,000 back or whatever it is. Um, I don't wanna get into too much details, but there are a lot of different ways to structure your engagement with your investors. So if let's, let me just give you examples of what might happen for you guys. So one thing might happen is, let's say this becomes a lifestyle business. Let's say that you really need investment, but you never want to sell this company, that this is something that you just want to run as a lifestyle business. Well, if you go to investor, the investor is going to want to own a part of your company, right? Wasn't but maybe that's not what you want to set up. Maybe what you want to set up is, if you look at this, is this uh, one called the NDVC. Uh, uh, these, are, these are different investment uh, strategies where what you can do is you can set up and say, all right, here's what we're going to do. You're going to give me $100,000 and I'm going to start paying you back in three or four years. Um, I'm going to pay you back that $100,000 on my gross revenue. So what, what that looks like is let's say in three years you're making $100,000 a year and you set up with this investor that 4% of that revenue is going to go back and pay back that investor uh, times a return, right? So you set up that agreement up front, knowing that you know you never want to sell your company, that you don't. Uh, and so, to attract an investor, is you set up this sort of instrument that then they will get their principal, their, all their money back, and a return. And then when that's done, you guys can part ways. They don't any own, own any of your company. You got the capital you needed. You remain a lifestyle business to where you're never going to sell. And it just becomes a business that you own for 20, 30, 40 years. So there's different ways in which you can structure relationships with investors where you can maintain the ownership of the company and they can get what they need as well. Any questions on that? I'm going through a lot. Okay. Um, angel investors. Um, so again, like typically how this works on startups is you will go friends and family, get twenty, thirty thousand dollars uh, that will advance it, and then you'll go to angel investors. Angels are people who invest a portion of their wealth uh, in companies instead of stocks, real estates. They typically write checks of ten to twenty thousand um, dollars. They fill the role between a friends and family round and a venture capital round. Uh, the disadvantages is there's a lot of un, uh, unsophisticated angels out there. Um, so try to just select your angels carefully. And what you want to do is you want to try to get angel investors that can provide more than just money, uh, that uh, can provide connections, domain expertise, but that can really bring a value add to your business. Um, so venture capital and private equity. Um, I just want to explain real quick the differences between the two. Um, so venture capital and private equity firms both 
uh, raise pools of capital from accredited investors known as limited partners, and they both do, do so in order to invest in privately owned companies. Their goals are the same, to increase the values of the businesses they invest in and then sell those companies for a profit. Um, um, the reason why, uh, what, when we state that uh, you want to really take a look at uh, when you form a startup, is venture capital uh, what you want? You need to understand what venture capital is. And what it is, is it's a group of people that are investing on the behalf of other individuals. And so because of that, there is a different relationship of, of what they're going to see your company being than a friends and family or even uh, an angel investor. They are going to have specific metrics that are needed to be hit for their investors. And so they're, you're going to be structured on their timeline if they invest with you, or it's a mutual agreed upon timeline. Let me, um, just, let me uh, jump in really quick right there, Matt. So there's um, a stage of company that venture might be appropriate for. There's also a scope of ambition or growth rate that a venture capitalist might be appropriate for. They're probably not appropriate for a lot of what we're talking about. So I wanna redirect a little towards Martin's question in the chat, which is about angels. And the angels, he, he says, Oh, Mitchell, you already responded to it. Actually, let's share the question out though. So everyone kind of sees the dialogue a little bit. So Martin was essentially kind of asking how angels operate. Mitchell, why don't you, why don't you just verbally explain what your uh, response was? And Yeah, so with, with angel investors, you have to remember basically anyone who, who qualifies as an accredited investor, as Matt shared early, can be one. So there's going to be a really wide range. We work with groups like Queen of the Angels uh, out of Ohio. That's a conglomerate of several hundred accredited investors where the group as a whole might see deals, share them out to all the angels, and then people who are interested can raise their hand and say, hey, I'd like to invest in this deal. Let's talk terms. Uh, on the other hand, we might work with an individual who spent 30 years in the RV industry, uh, has made a lot of money, is retired, and now wants to invest in uh, the RV industry or wants to invest in uh, audio around the industry in a space he knows or with people he knows in the area he knows. And, and an investor like that is more likely uh, to not be working with other people. They're, they'll be kind of just working on their own to find deals. And usually they'll source their deals through trusted parties. So it might be an organization like the Idea Center where the local angels know that we deal flow and they'll come to demo days to see what we have. Uh, or it might be uh, colleagues that they had while they were working in industry uh, or friends or family. And yes, uh, angels do usually want equity. Uh, most of most angel investments will be, and I'll dive in later on into the actual terms of how they like to look at deals, uh, but but they they look to do equity investments for for the most part. So uh, another question, what, what are the conditions you believe could uh, be satisfied by uh, before raising a growth round, aka to scale? Example, product market fit, business model CAC. It's a great question. And uh, let me actually pull this up here. Let me see if I can add. Let's see. Um, so this, th that question varies. So um, let me see, sorry, give me one second. Um, let me see if I can pull it. This is good. Okay, here it is. Okay, so take a look at this. Here's an example of a formula, and it's becoming almost formulaic with a lot of these, uh, these uh, uh, venture groups. So take a look at this slide. Um, can you guys see it? Yeah, hey, Matt, are you going to be sharing this deck? Yeah, I could. Yeah, for sure. Okay, that'd be great. Um, let me... Okay. Okay, so can you guys see this? Here's a, here's a better one. Let's use this one, for example. 
Okay, so there are formulas that you can follow. So let's say you're uh, a software company, right? Here is kind of a formula. And again, I want, I want to preface this this way. To Mitchell's point, if you're going angel, right, there are really, really sophisticated angels and there are really, really not sophisticated angels. And again, how you pitch to angels, if it were me, um, it depends on, you can really raise money through emotion, right? You can raise it on what's called FOMO strategies, which is fear of missing out, which is a real thing. Uh, you just say, hey, this deal's going to go quick. You know, you create a FOMO mentality. That really works. But there is a sophistication to angel rounds, if you guys are interested. And this is kind of it. We can walk through this. So if you're at a friends and family round, Typically, you're at a, let's just look at the stage. You're at a hypothesis, meaning, hey, I got this idea. Uh, you maybe have a, what's called a wireframe where you've built out what it looks like. ARR means annual recurring revenue. You have no, you have, the company has made zero revenue. Uh, MRR means monthly recurring revenue. You might have a few bucks in the door. Uh, your CAC LTV is nothing. Um, and then what you want to do is the value of your company ranges from, let's say, a million or two. And then round size is around 50000 to 500000 bucks, right? So this is kind of what you're raising it on. In the pre-seed stage, this is where the angels play, right? So this is the gap they fill. So you have your friends and family. Then the pre-seed is where you go to free angels. In the software area, you should have something like a minimal viable product that your dad helped you build, right? So you went to your friends and family, you got 50K, you build out some minimal viable product. Uh, you should have a, either uh, the progression should have, you should have a, a few pilot customers uh, or some sort of validated a proof of concept. This, this matters on how big your minimal vi vi viable product is. You should have less than $100,000 in uh, annual recurring revenue. Your monthly recurring revenue should be around $5,000, $25,000 a month. Um, your growth, so you really, this is what is going to excite angel investors, is this idea of 20% growth month after month, meaning, hey, I made five bucks last month, and guess what? I made seven bucks this next month. Not those numbers, hopefully bigger, but that's the idea, is you want to show three to four months or however you're showing this monthly recurring growth. Um, when it comes to uh, um, um, uh, your, your CAC LTV, um, this is where you're really starting to show data that's moving towards uh, your, your CAC to LTV ratio. CAC to LTV means for every dollar you spend to acquire a customer, uh, you're making three bucks off them. Like in this stage, you, you don't have to be there yet. Uh, but you have to show some sort of data supporting that, that there is good clarity on either secondary mar uh, on competitors or some sort of initial traction or data showing that you're going to get there. Um, in this, you're raising the company at pretty much below a, a $5 million valuation. And at this stage, you're kind of raising anywhere from 250 to 1.5 million. Um, yeah, so um, there's a question. I think I just pulled up. Um, any, yeah, any questions on this? I have a question about the ethics of VC. It seems to me that the ultimate goal is to raise the bottom line according to the timeline demands of the investors and or fear. I confess that doesn't sit quite right with me. How are you to bring Catholic social teaching to bear out on courses and structures we select? That is a great question. Um, so you got to look at it this way, like VC gets a bad rap and, and, uh, and I understand why, but you got to remember what venture capital is. Venture capital, you're going to a, a bunch of people and you're saying, if you give me money, I'm going to generate a return for your money, right? That's, that's what you're getting in bed with, right? They are strictly about how can I, how can I 3x to 5x return these people's money within a five to seven year time frame, right? So, so they're looking at you in those eyes. They're basically looking and saying, all right, this company, if I invest a dollar today, I can get $5 back in uh, a three to seven year time frame. 
So, if, so you you need to know that you're walking into that relationship. Um, it's not about giving money away. It's about getting a return. Now, to your point with Catholic social teachings to bear, you're exactly right. That that was kind of why I started this call is because you got to realize that venture capital is not for everyone. However, angel investors who 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 invest they invest for a variety of reasons. They might invest because they really know the area. They might invest because they really like Catholic social teachings and wanna see impact. There can be a variety of different ways angel investors invest, and it doesn't have to be strictly ROI driven. It can be more driven towards, hey, I want a return. It doesn't have to be massive. But what I really, the real reason I'm doing it is I wanna see impact on Catholic social teachings. So, so it's, it's really about making sure that you're going after the investors that align with the metrics you're measured by. That's what I'm trying to highlight here, if that makes sense. Hey Matt, I have a question. Sure. Um, this is actually regarding the approach of investment. Um, so like we're, for instance, like in a few months gonna be raising something like mid-level six figures, hope, hopefully. Uh, probably mainly through uh, investor network, maybe some institutions. Um, but the general advice is, well, depending on who you're working with, that if you want advice, ask for money, and if you want money, ask for advice. And that's just always felt dishonest to me. Um, like if you are, you know, reaching out to people and you know you want money, it, it seems manipulative to go for them and ask for advice so that you then might ask for, so that you might ultimately get money. Just curious kind of how you'd recommend approaching that sort of thing. Like if you know you want to raise, say like $300,000, $800,000, something like that, whatever it is. Um, and especially if you're dealing with, you know, cold leads or, or angels or institutions with whom you have uh, as yet no relationship, how would you recommend approaching that? Just going in to, I, I suppose this would be kind of the, the advantage of working with institutions because this is their, their whole shtick, but curious if you had any recommendations on that front. Yeah, so, uh, and I'd love to hear like other people's point on this, but I have talked to some of the smartest uh, venture capitalists. Um, here's, here's the issue with it, is you, we, the problem is, is with these early stage companies, um, you, uh, an investor, if he's only using his analytical mind, he will always identify risks risks associated with the project right always sure and the reason why people say that is because it's like the, the there is an emotion to investing at this early stage it's not when you get into the later stages you can literally assess um on a on an excel spreadsheet the potential return of the investment because you can look at three years uh, history, you can forecast that out, and you can actually make a decision pretty analytical. But in this stage, there will always be gaps. And the reason I'm saying that is because there is a level of selling yourself to capture that investment. And so when they say something like that, what they're really saying is, is you've got to kind of be the hot girl in a way. You've got to be something that stands out that emotionally gets them to say, I'm I emotionally believe in this because analytically they won't. They're, they will find holes. So you got to get them to where you are, they're, 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 you are selling confidence within you for them to invest. Because if not, they will analyze it to death and they will eventually find a reason not to invest. That like, here's, here's the honest truth. Like in these early stages, and it does sound, um, I, I understand how it can sound um, unethical, but there is things that work like FOMO, like the fear of missing out is a real thing. Um, that if you bake in this FOMO strategy and baked within how you do investments, uh, it, it really does work. Um, because you're selling yourself more than you're selling your numbers. Adding, adding on to that, Eric, I, th I think it's really important to distinguish between who you're raising from as well. Um, there's going to be people who just say, hey, if you've got financial ask, make a financial ask. That's 
That's what I'm here for. That's what I'm set up to do. Let's talk business. There's also going to be people that really want to help you out, that believe in your mission, that might want to put money in down the, the road, but their, their primary role is going to actually be offering guidance. And that can come in everything from helping you structure your board, helping you understand channels to get to market, helping you understand opportunities for growth, the industry, your competition, whatever it might be. And so when you're raising money, you want to, referencing back when Matt talked about friends, family, and fools, what you want to try to do is actually stack the people who are supporting you financially with people who really understand your market are sophisticated and not unsophisticated. And so a lot of times you'll find those people through conversations with industry experts where you might reach out and you're, it's not a disingenuous, you might not even be looking to raise money from them. Instead, you're mm -hmm. looking to understand their insights and they might then want to give you money because they see that you're coachable, you're approachable, you're someone who you know, has integrity, who seems to be going about the business the right way. And, and that can be attractive for a lot of investors. And so just remember that there's a lot of factors at play to this idea of emotional investing. Um, and so that's why there's often that comment of, hey, if you ask for guidance, you'll get money. It's not this idea of yeah. going to a venture capitalist and saying, just give me guidance because everyone knows, okay, you're, you're not approaching this unless you want money. It's more about right. people uh, who might be supporting you in other capacities that may also be capable of and interested in giving you money. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's where that comes from. Gotcha. Thanks, guys. Anything else? Yeah, I mean, I've got a bunch of questions, but I don't want to, if you guys still have uh, no, go ahead. a presentation to go. Okay, so um, if this is going off track or if we need to take it offline, that's fine. Just let me know. So we, we bootstrapped, essentially, we have an enterprise SaaS software. We bootstrapped it uh, this far. Um, it is live and functioning. There's still a ton of tweaking that needs to do, but we finally got results back where we're actually showing impact. Mm -hmm. um, and impact in a great way. Of course, the next step of extending it past, you know, the beta testing. Here, Jam, just give a yeah. few details on like the user base you have and some of the impact. Just so yeah. Okay. So the product is the product serves the enterprise version of the product serves a diocese or archdiocese. It's uh, it you know provides some of the uh, you know, the basic needs around a diocese, but at the same time, the underlying feature uh, or the underlying impact is that it increases the ministry's uh, ministry activity and ministry uh, engagement and then the proof that we just gotten is that does increase the donations so we're seeing crazy results on it now now that we have one enterprise sort of enterprise a whole diocese uh, rolling with it um, which is fantastic and then we have the same model for parishes on a condensed model now, it's a lot easier to sell to a diocese for us because that's been our history. We were an agency first and we're pivoting to a product. Uh, we have the relationships with diocese. So, but that sale to a diocese is a longer pipeline. It takes a little more time. So my question is this, is I've got, uh, we have, uh, we could continue to bootstrap, basically run agency and product at the same time, but it's gonna take us a, a lot longer to get to the next, to the next uh, just by the amount of time and effort we can put into it to get to the next step so with all the forecasting we've done we've essentially decided we need to get some investment in the door um, in order to get the product roll out to more audience we've got three other dioceses approaching us as well as the byzantine right um, uh, uh, which depending on your knowledge of the catholic church is sort of like another right within it's sort of like a really big diocese if you think about it that way that's global there's a ton of opportunity there. Our question is, there's, uh, we don't know if we're at seed stage. Uh, we have a rolling functional product. We're definitely not at venture stage because we don't want to give away necessarily a huge amount of equity right now. Uh, but we, and we don't need a ton of money, but we, we need more than, you know. I, my, my question really is, what, uh, what's the safest way to gather investment in a short period of time? Yeah, so I would answer it two ways. We got, we, okay, so we are dealing with a company, well, we dealt with it and we kind of solved it, but um, um, we have a company that was selling to cities and their sales cycles were really, really long. 
Mm-hmm. And we luckily got the foresight from another company that was dealing with the same issues that was that they were having it was becoming impossible for them to raise a series a round Mm -hmm. the reason is is because again understanding how venture works uh they want they need in or once they place money they need to show uh a three to five x return within a time frame Mm -hmm. and when you have sales cycles that are long it might cause um, you to actually not even have the ability to raise venture, depending mm-hmm. on, a, 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 again, it's, it's not only understanding your sales cycle, but it's understanding the, the potential market growth. So, so right. there's two factors in this, right? So, so if you have long sales cycles, that's gonna cause the, the, the idea of how fast you can ramp your sales uh, not to be compelling for venture. But I'm curious as to what your total TAM is as well in the market you're in, that, it's, it, that you're going to reach a ceiling that venture is not going to be compelled in either. So you have two factors that I'd be curious to look at is how long of a sales cycle are you talking about and what is your total TAM? Because those two factors might just make it to where venture is not even a possibility. Um, and that's still okay because then what that does is it creates a new strategy. Maybe what you want to do is go angel to private equity, right? Mm-hmm. So maybe what you'd want to do is angel, uh, raise a, an angel round that the angel investors understand your sales cycle issue, um, but also understand your TAM issue. But what you do is you run the business not based upon growth, but raise, uh, but raise it on the idea of EBITDA. So what you do yeah. is you inject capital, make sure your EBITDA is staying strong so that then you, you're attractive to private equity down the road and inject larger capital uh, uh, investment down that path. So, so I would look at it that way is to make sure that what is your TAM? Because again, these guys need to show insane TAMs and they need to show a, a pretty decent uh, monthly recurring revenue. So mm-hmm. if your sales cycle can't hit those, I would, I would raise around a very sophisticated angel group that doesn't show, that doesn't put you in the path of venture, but more put you in the path of either more angel rounds or eventually private equity. Yeah, that's, that's exactly the path we're running. The, the other piece is that we have this unique opportunity being a mission oriented product that actually happens to be a fully functional SaaS product with all the benefits and features on that side. And, and, uh, and value to investing or to investors, valuable to investors, but there's a whole missional angel group that because the proof that we're showing is, hey, we can make more money for a diocese and a parish, even in the midst of COVID and scandals. Um, it, uh, we're very close to being able to prove that. We've got a whole other group that would angel invest and say, hey, I'd donate to an organization, but why would I, I might as well invest in you know, an organization have a likelihood of return or we can, we can come up. I mean, we're working with one who there's a, there's a donor for the diocese who it gets complicated and it's unique. So maybe it, maybe I give you a call and take it offline, but um, uh, you know, we have a donor to a group that would see it as, Hey, could we take, I'll take an investment in your company, but I'm also going to get the diocese on board because I'm the largest donor to them. And let's do that investment goes into, you know, if there is a return, it'll go into an endowment for the diocese. Um, anyways, yeah, there's exactly. a ton of options. There, there's so many options. And another one I can think of is, um, um, okay, so you could go, it's called a share note. Or, or, yeah, this is. Just really quick. We might want to take this one offline. Okay. Yeah. Because I know okay. you only got 50 it's, un- it's unique. Yeah, it's let's, really. Let's do that. Yeah, I mean, these are awesome problems to have. So way to go on that. I'll, I'll give you a shout later. Okay. Um, uh, before, okay, so Mitchell's going to go through, there is, um, um, okay, so let's say you understand, all right, um, I'm going to go raise an angel round. Um, I need $250,000 uh, invested. Um, now it's, it, uh, we kind of went over like the idea of like, all right, so, Either I'm going to invest the $250,000 for uh, an investor will say, okay, I'll give you $250,000 for 10% of the company, 
or I'm going to give you $250,000 for a future date of value. Um, but again, there's so many devils in the details now around what this agreement really looks like. So Mitchell uh, uh, can go, Mitchell, do you want me to share screen or do you want? I, I can share it. Okay, so Mitchell's gonna go through, uh, once you have that understanding, there's all these terms that really matter uh, to set up a really successful partnership between you and your investor. So it's really critical that you guys are aware of kind of uh, this, this structure, so. Okay, can everyone see the screen? Okay, so the first term when you're raising money, the goal of this is really to give you some quick uh, understanding of what you need to be looking for, regardless of whether you raise from an angel, from venture capital, from private equity, these are terms that when you take dollars in that you need to understand. Um, so that way, as, as you're looking to negotiate, these, these can make or, or break a deal for you. Um, so the first term is a cap. So you'll see these on notes when you are raising funding that will be uh, either a safe note, convertible note, uh, a share agreement, a seal agreement. Um, a cap is what is going to basically put the valuation on before a price round. So my example here would be if Julie's raising 100K for a lemonade stand, she wants John Henry to give her that money, John's going to ask for a $500,000 cap. And what he's basically saying is that, hey, I want my equity to convert at no more than that cap. So if the priced round that she raises down the road, she needs more money, and now it's a million dollars, John's note, instead of converting for 100K worth of equity, is going to convert for 200K worth of equity. And this is paired with a discount uh, a lot of the time. So the way a discount works is rather than putting a cap on it, and sometimes they'll be paired, sometimes they'll be separated, sometimes it's the lesser or the greater of, um, discount rates say, hey, whatever the price is at the next round, uh, you're going to get your equivalent in shares for whatever that discount percentage is. And we'll share these uh, slides with you guys so you can read through them. But I just want quickly a high level go through these and then can answer questions you might have on anything individually. The next thing that you need to look for that might happen is a no cap, no discount note, which basically is a safe note uh, to the question earlier of what those look like. It's pretty rare to see safe notes when you're raising in this type of environment that you guys are, you might be able to get a safe note from, for example, a religious institution that wants to be both a customer and potentially a financial backer. They might be willing to do a no cap, no discount safe, where basically they say, we're going to give you $100,000. And if it's the next round's worth 10 million, then we'll only get 0.01%. If it's worth a million, we'll get 1%. We don't care. We want to support you. We'll get a little money back down the road, but we're not really focused on valuation. So these are these are the most entrepreneur friendly terms you can get. But again, it's it's pretty rare to get someone willing to do a no cap, no discount safe. So the next term to understand uh, that you need to look for when you're raising funding is what the interest rate will be. Uh, this is pretty simple. So most notes, uh, if you're raising notes. Uh, will have some sort of interest rate on them. In the Midwest, you usually see anywhere from five to 8%. Um, and this basically is, hey, a year later, if there still has not been a subsequent round of investment raised, my $100 is now worth $108. If it's two years later, that's going to be 100 and, you know, 20 something because it compounds. So uh, this just allows uh, investors to kind of still get small returns if the subsequent rounds are delayed. And, and this deals with the time value of money, uh, which is just that the longer those dollars are in without seeing a return, the less valuable they are to the investor. So the next thing that you need to be thinking about when you're raising money from anyone is, is distinguishing between pre-money and post-money valuation. And this is really, really important because this determines how much equity you're going to have to give up in your business. So for those not familiar, valuation is when you're raising money, you're trying, it's your best guess between you and the investors as to what you think the company is worth today. 
And this can be based on a variety of factors. Some investors will look at past revenue. Some investors will look at future projected revenue. Every business is going to look different and you're, you're going to want to kind of talk through how to best value your company. But the, the main thing to understand is a pre-money valuation is going to be, hey, this is the company's value before you receive any funding. And the post-money valuation is the valuation after you receive the funding. So pre-money valuation plus new funding equals post-money. And this is really, really important because if you get these messed up, this can dramatically change the equity position that the investor gets. So for instance, the example I've got here for you references, if a venture firm agrees to a pre-money valuation of 10 million, they then invest 5 million on top of it, it's now $15 million post-money valuation. So if you based their investment on the pre-money valuation, uh, then you know with the with that it would be fifty percent of the company that was given up with that five million dollar stake versus thirty three percent of the company if you use the post money valuation. So looking at the next slide for you guys reference, this just shows you the difference between those two. So if the company was only valued at ten million post and the same five million was put in, all of a sudden that investor owns that fifty percent versus if they said hey we're going to do a 10 million pre-money valuation, then he got 33% of the company. So just by changing the word pre versus post completely shifts the ownership percentage in this, this example. So I'm happy to talk through examples further later with anyone, but this is a really, really important thing to make sure you understand whenever you're raising funding is what type of valuation are you talking about? Um, and Karina, the formula to get the pre-money valuation, that's going to depend company by company so this is where it's it's really important to kind of understand what your business is what your market looks like a lot of times we'll use other companies that are very similar in similar industries and look at how they set their valuations and, and how did they raise it to strengthen your argument to an investor one thing i'd say to everyone by the way valuation at the end of the day is going to be determined on who's willing to give you money so you'll have different investors willing to give you money at different valuations. The investor at the end of the day, if they're not willing to put in the money at the valuation, they won't. So they're usually the driver of what the valuation they like to see is. And then you can either agree and say, yep, this is fair. I'm going to take your money or say, no, I don't think this is right. And go looking for other people to give you money. So building off of this, um, then liquidation preferences are something you also want to be thinking about whenever you're negotiating with investors. Liquidation preferences basically determine who will get paid and when they'll get paid. Um, and they're also relevant whenever you exit a company. 1X is pretty standard, but if you go raise money, for example, from a Tim Connors with Pivot North Capital, uh, who's you know very successful investor and backed a lot of major name companies, he's probably going to have stiffer terms because his money also comes with a much larger network. And, and so he might ask for 2X liquidation uh, preferences or 3X. And, and that's something you have to consider is, hey, is the value I'm receiving from this investor worth a steeper liquidation preference? The other thing that you need to be thinking about when it comes to future rounds of investments, exits, and follow on is pro rata rights. This is a term that gets thrown around a lot. And pro rata basically is a clause that allows investors to put more money in down the road. So whenever we put money into a company, as you raise more money, we're going to be diluted down if we don't put more money in. So if we originally own 10% of the company, you raise another $10 million, all of a sudden you only own 1% of the company. So what pro rata, cla pro rata clauses allow an investor to do is to step in when you raise that next 10 million and say, hey, we actually wanna give you 2 million of that total 10 million you're raising. This allows us to maintain our ownership percentage of the company. So pretty simple, but again, it's, it's a clause that uh, most investors will look to have. What you need to be really cautious of are what's called super pro rata rights. Super pro rata is saying, not only do I want the ability to maintain my ownership, I want the ability to actually expand my ownership. So I want the ability to buy up to 5 million of that 10 million rather than the 2 million to just maintain. And why that can be dangerous is that can crowd out other investors. So if there's a really strategic person you really want to bring on the next round, there might not be room for them if some of your past investors have super pro rights. 
So I'd really caution you to try and avoid uh, ever structuring a deal with super pro rata rights. Finally, the option pool. Um, this is something that you need to think about when you're raising money is you're going to have employees most likely. You're going to want to probably give them a stake in the business. And when you're raising a round of investment, uh, a lot of times investors will look to negotiate an option pool. The option pool will come out of your equity. It will not come out of the investor's equity. So this is really important to make sure that you're figuring out the right size of the option pool, how that will affect your ownership and how that will, uh, you know, do you have the right amount of equity that will incentivize your employees? Will you be able to retain talent versus giving up too much of the company uh, crippling your ability to raise future rounds of investments. Pretty standard option pool sizes uh, in a round are usually 15, 10 to 15 to 20 percent, depending on the type of company that you're on. And again, this is something that kind of varies uh, individual by individual. And, um, Mitchell, let me jump in real quick. So just cool. to get a time check, we have two more minutes. We have a session right after this for everyone's awareness. This is the one for those thinking about going nonprofit or for profit. Napa Legal Institute is helping with that. John Cannon's jumping over there right now. So I'll stay on this one if this one runs a few minutes long, but uh, feel free to start transitioning over that one and know that John Cannon's kind of emceeing and ready to field it. Okay. Yep. And I went through quickly. We're basically done. Just be very careful when you're thinking about your board, who's on the board and how you compose it. Uh, your board of directors is going to have governance over the company. So uh, making sure that you have the right board in place is really important and something to spend time uh, negotiating and getting right in the deals. And then investing uh, as the last thing is this relates to your employee's option pool. You probably want to make sure whenever you're negotiating investment uh, that you're negotiating the right investing schedules, both for your option pool and for yourself. A lot of times investors won't be willing to put money in if you don't vest some of your own equity to ensure uh, that you'll stay with the company because uh, especially in early stage companies, you as the founder is the lifeblood of the company uh, and without you, the business is most likely to succeed. So that was a really quick 10 minute through a ton of terms. Uh, we'll make this deck available and I'm also happy to, to chat with anyone individually about specific terms. Uh, I know that was a lot. Mitchell, Matt, thank you guys. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> See ya. Thanks, guys. Good. Thanks. See ya. Matt Mitchell, I ended up, sh I've got, I've already gotten requests for the pitch deck on this one, so I think that's a pretty good signal of interest. Henry, this is what I, this is what I meant to show you yesterday. <laughs> Paul will be joining us in August, as should you guys, to bring his, and he'll bring his portable humidor. Yes. Well, there we go. That's the office man. humidor. I've got the home humidor. <laughs> it's like Ron Burgundy. I want my office to smell like rich mahogany cigar. <laughs> I'll have to bring some, uh, some, some of the cigars you can only get in Canada when yeah. I come down. Yeah, we, hey. need to, we need to make this a party potluck. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we'll see you guys.